All right, welcome back, everybody. So in the last video, there was uh, there was talk of a a first solution to a differential equation, and sure enough, we actually went through an entire uh, derivation, an entire solution, a computation of a solution to a differential equation. And we found what we called the, uh, the general solution to that differential equation. Now, I wanted to, I want to make sure these videos are no more than about 15 minutes. So I wanted to cut that video off before it got too long. But there is one last thing I wanted to say about this video, uh, about this particular solution and then uh, talk about how this method that what we did last time extends uh, into a more general setting. So let me tell you about this general solution, this, uh, this k e to the a t minus b over a. So let me go back to my new note. Oh, wait, no, I should just make a new note. There we go. So our general solution, y of t equals k e to the a t minus b over a. So we went ahead and applied that to our uh, to our terminal velocity or to our free fall uh, model, and we came up with k e to the minus gamma t over m, and that would be minus m g over gamma. We came up with this model for our uh, for our solution. Now, in order for us to really see what's going on here, let me go ahead and show you what this looks like, what this particular v function looks like. Notice, we, we did this last time. For terminal velocity, we said v tends to minus g over gamma as t goes to infinity. So we know we have a horizontal asymptote for this function. And I'll go ahead and just put that asymptote right here, which turns out to actually be a solution to the differential equation Right, this is the case when k is equal to zero. So this is minus mg over gamma. Okay, so we actually do have an honest-to-goodness solution that is a constant, and we talked about those. Those were what we called equilibrium solutions. So what happens if we don't start on that solution? Well, let's say that I throw the object up in the air first, or no, well, let's, look, let's go ahead and drop that object from rest. So that would be uh, saying that my v0 condition is that I give it no initial velocity. So think about just dropping a, or, or a skydiver just kind of jumping out of a plane. They start from rest relative to the ground and then start falling, which is exactly what we see because of this exponential term. We see a decay, an exponential decay. And very, very similarly, if we throw uh, our object up in the air, think like a baseball or something, you're throwing something up in the air, it too will exponentially decay toward this equilibrium solution. And perhaps even more surprisingly, if we start off by throwing this baseball downward, then there is enough drag force to actually slow the object down. And that actually brings our solution up to the equilibrium as opposed to pulling it down. And we'll notice here that there's a point in uh, when, we throw the, when we throw the ball up in the air that it stops and then turns around. So that would be the point where velocity is zero. And honestly, that's about all there is to this particular model, is that we are able to identify some important feature about this uh, about the system when we consider uh, certain, when, when there are certain considerations made. But if I go back to this original solution uh, and ask, okay, so that we, we've talked about a case when a is equal to a negative number. What happens if a is actually a positive number? Well, then no longer do we get this, uh, this nice equilibrium solution uh, that we want to tend toward. No, if, uh, if a is greater than zero, then that would imply, right? That's what this arrow means. It implies that e to the a t goes to infinity as t goes to infinity, which means that we're not going toward the equilibrium solution. Instead, we would be traveling away. Right? And that has everything to do with, an, uh, with a topic called stability, or what the stability of our solution looks like. So solutions can either tend toward or away or both 
uh, from, to or from equilibrium solutions. And it just depends on certain factors. And the factor here is encoded in that A, whether it's positive or negative. In this case, if A is negative, we get a stable solution, right? Solutions want to go toward this guy, uh, toward this constant solution. Or if A is positive, our solutions over time will want to deviate from that solution. Okay, and that's essentially all I wanted to say for that particular equation. But I did want to show you how our methodology extended uh, to a, uh, a wider setting. Remember that our, sol our differential equations, our models can usually be put into this form where we have some rate function f is equal to the derivative of this function. So the slope is given by some function of t and y. But in this case, there, there could be a way to separate this guy or make, make a, another assumption about what this rate function looks like. What if f of t and y is actually a product of two functions? What if it's a g of t times an h of y? So what if I can separate these guys as their own single variable functions? So what if that's the case? Then that would mean dy dt is equal to g of t times h of y. And then I could try to separate, just like I did last time. So dy uh, divided by h of y would be equal to g of t times dt. And then I could integrate. And hopefully I'd be able to integrate explicitly and then solve, the, uh, then solve for y of t. So let's actually do that with an example. And that's this example uh, 1.6 down here at the bottom of the screen. So I'll go ahead and blow it up a little bit. So there's this dude. So as an example, we're gonna go ahead and change up the independent variable as well. There's no reason why it has to be a time variable, but usually uh, when we're differentiating with respect to time, we're looking at a rate of change rather than a slope. So t usually corresponds to a time variable, hence a rate function as opposed to a slope field. Uh, so what we're doing in this case, dy dx, I'm going to go ahead and write this uh, as 1 over y times 1 plus x squared. Excellent. So this is what we are given, and we would like to find a general solution. So find a general solution for this equation. Okay, and that's usually how it would be given, like how we would be, how we would ask for it on an exam, or if uh, if you're if you encounter this in the wild, you would like to know which functions satisfy this equation. So if we were to separate this out, notice that I can multiply both sides by a y, and I can multiply the dx over to the other side, so I get dx over one plus x squared. If I then integrate then I'm just integrating y as if it was its own variable. So I get a 1 half y squared. I'm omitting the integration constant because I'm going to go ahead and put it over here with the other one on the right-hand side. Remember, I'm consolidating my integration constants from here on out onto one side. And I kind of glossed over it, but this is uh, the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus x squared is a vertical shift of the arctangent function. Excellent. So you can say the inverse tangent, whatever you'd like. I'm not picky. But if I wanted to solve this then, I get a y squared. If I want to solve this for y specifically, I multiply both sides by the 2. And I'm at this point, I'm just going to absorb all constants, all, all um, uh, changes to my constants. Uh, just, I'm just, just going to keep calling them the same variable. It just, and this is what many textbooks do as well. But they sweep that under the rug, and they just completely omit telling you that there actually is algebra happening here, right? Multiply by 2. All right. And then I can go ahead and take the square root of both sides. And I do have to be careful that there are two branches to this function. But that would be an explicit solution for this system, for this particular differential equation. 
All right, and I even have that down there. And sure, I even write it down in my notes that I made a concession that there is this new variable k that I'm calling twice c. But it really doesn't matter too much. You're just going to be shifting by a constant. It really doesn't matter. So just be, just again, be very aware that there is some algebra happening, but you don't have to worry about it too much. It's not going to change your solution by a whole lot. Okay, so the question then is, well, which branch of this function should I use? Should I use the positive branch or should I use the negative branch? Well, that depends. What do you, what would you, which one would you like to use? So let's say we were talking about y as being a population, a population size. Well, then sure, we have to make sure that population sizes are, first of all, they're, they're integers, but uh, we need to make sure that they are non-negative numbers. It doesn't make any sense to have a negative person or a negative bug or a negative uh, rabbit or a fox. So we need to make sure that we are taking some taking stock of what our uh, of what our context is. Remember, everything in differential equations should be done with some some tie to physical like to a physical application, so that we have context to compare against. So in this case, let's make sure that we have a positive population size, and that would make that would force us to use this positive branch. Awesome. So we know what we need to do. But there's also another issue about which constant should we use. Uh, C equals what now? Uh, well, that's going to really depend on which value you want your function to pass through. Remember, our slope field is going to give us a whole bunch of slopes that our function should be able to satisfy. And, oh, no. Voila. This is going to effectively just be a vector field. But notice, if I'm careful about where my solution wants to pass, it needs to be tangent to all these solutions. So it would probably look something like this. But that means that there would be a whole bunch of points that this solution has to pass through. And in particular, this guy right here, if I was saying t and y here, if I was saying that my solution had to pass through a very particular y value at zero, then I get what's called an initial condition, right? When time is zero, that's the beginning of the experiment. So this is the initial configuration of our system, and we call it the initial condition, okay? So that tells us exactly which solution we're locked into. And this is exactly how we determine what the constant is and which branch of the solution we want to use if we don't have any physical intuition. So that is uh, the pitfall that I was uh, alluding to in the last video, that there is a certain subtlety that you need to account for when you have these general solutions, especially when you're dealing with these kinds of equations where you may or may not actually be able to solve for y explicitly. We will talk about these equations again very, very soon. But they, they're a branch, they're a type of equation called, let me bring this back up here. These are called separable differential equations. And in Calc 2, you usually see some version of these, some, uh, some semblance of a separable equation. And this is, uh, this is actually a very, uh, very special kind of differential equation that does show up from time to time. And it's actually very, very useful to know how to solve these guys quickly as we will see at the beginning of chapter two in our first our study of first order linear equations. Awesome. So as a brief note, you should feel free to skip the next video on uh, classifying differential equations on a first pass. Right. This is uh, this is a a very common uh, very common topic to talk about at the beginning of uh, of a semester or beginning of a term, uh, but it, without any context. Like classifying differential equations is just memorizing terms. And if you've ever been my student, then my, first of all, my apologies. Second, uh, if, you've been, if you try to, try to memorize something out of context, you're not going to know anything about it. It's, you're you're going to know, okay, you will know something, but you're not going to understand it. You're not going to know how this, guy, how this guy functions, how it operates, and in what context you should be using it. So as a quick uh, uh, to make this so that we're not too long-winded uh, 
feel free to skip the classification of differential equations on a first pass. Come back to it when there are when there's more context, right? For the videos that come after uh, after the classification one, I will make sure that I explain the uh, uh, the individual terms that I'm using. So I'll make sure that if I talk about a, f a second order linear homogeneous differential equations uh, equation with variable coefficients, then you will know exactly what I mean. I will go ahead and explain that as I use the terms. But feel free to skip the classification video.